<laughs> Hi, my sweet one. Hello. How are you? You look like the brightest light ever. You do. I'm so excited about this. Thank you. Thank you. I put, I put like, I put color on for you and I was just like, and I poured myself list like up some coffee and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to show up for Kimberly with the best attitude and the best version of myself, even if it's hard, because that's how you make me feel when I'm around you. Same. I was like, I'm going to put on actual clothes, change out of my yoga clothes. Human. I've been caffeinating for the past five hours. So I will spare you. I was trying to like have a like less manic energy for you today, but it's so good to see you. I'm, I'm here up. for all the energy. <laughs> I I mean I'm just in te I am so proud of you and proud to know you and excited for you and excited for this book and the message. And so you recently wrote a book called This Is What I Know About Art. And it happened to come out in the midst of a pandemic and the second wave of the civil rights movement. So well, as someone who, like, no big deal, what did that mean to you? Yeah. Oh, it meant so many things. Um, wait, hold on. I just realized I was cleaning yesterday and, like, moved my copy that I keep in this spot. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay, take it, get it, get it, get it. Hi, everyone. So this is the book. Woo! Woo! Um, Where can everybody order it? You can order Where it. Do you prefer people and, to order. Um, I highly recommend going to the Penguin Random House website. They seem to have the copies and sending them the most swiftly. Um, and so to answer your question, what does it mean? Right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Man, so many things. I think in general, for so many of us, I think, and I'm curious how you feel about this too. Like as, as people who have fashioned ourselves as storytellers, um, what you don't see on the behind the scenes is that it comes from an understanding that we don't see ourselves represented enough. And I think the energy that also sometimes can almost like infect us in a way that we don't think our story should be told. And so it's this constant kind of battle of like, I want to join this dialogue because I know this story needs to be told, but also does anyone care? And so it was wild to not only push myself to finish this book and work with incredible editors, but also to have it come out literally on the day of Blackout Tuesday and thinking about, you know, really critically, is it important for a book like this right now? Is it important to look at art right now? Um, what way are, what ways are those two things intersected? And I think in general, and this is a reason why I love you so much as a journalist and as a thinker and as just like a light in my life, because there is a responsibility that we have when we make our voice heard. And you want to and absolutely have to make sure that you're contributing to the dialogue because otherwise it's just noise. And so I think overcoming that hump of like, this isn't just noise, this is vital, this is important, this can be you know something to help other people in their pursuit of freedom. Um, was an internal battle that my therapist and I have been working through for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> well, I think that I, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And I relate to it so deeply. And it's, that's actually very specifically been something that's on my mind a lot lately because for, for a number of reasons, and it's, it's incredibly layered, but we like our truth and this, this goes for any, everybody, our truth and what our story is, is something that we live every single day. And so sometimes it almost feels like incredibly obvious and you forget that people don't see things through your lens where they haven't done the work that you've done or they don't share that experience. And so it's like you don't know what to articulate and what people need and, and what they will be able to receive. I think that that's the thing that like I'm trying to wrap my mind around is even if I put out these stories, even if I put out this information, I, I, I will never know what part of it people will be able to receive. And so the answer that I come back to is you just have to trust that when you like use your voice in the most authentic possible way and you tell the truth in the most honest and pure way, 
then that is like your job done. And I and I and I want to know if you relate to this, especially because you you have worked and work in a predominantly white field, which is art, especially when you were working in the museum. But it's like there's this battle of showing up 100% as yourself and knowing that there's so much value in showing up as yourself and, and giving your perspective and giving your insight and giving your thoughts, but also like being surrounded by people who make you feel like you should feel lucky you're here. And you're vo like, we brought you here for a very specific reason, but just because we brought you here for this very specific reason doesn't mean that you get to come here as your full self. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you can like that you ever felt or related to when you were working at the museum? I would say, honestly, I get more of that from fashion. <laughs> or fashion, which is weird because that's like an entire field of self-expression and right. individuality. But also, but why do you why do you get more of that from fashion? I think, you know, we've been in so many of the same rooms and in partnership with so many of the same brands. And, you know, when you're in the luxury space, there's an expectation of gratitude that I think is very well founded. But I think coming in as a representative of a community that has not traditionally been highlighted or supported, there is a way that um, we're expected to maintain a certain level of deference, obedience, um, hmm. you know, that I, I think is really odd. Um, and in some ways it mirrors the art world, but I think for me, I have a unique position in that so much of the work that I do operates outside of institutions that I don't often think, you know, I've, I've been, I fielded many questions about, you know, what does it mean to work at a predominantly white institution? And it, and it's worded exactly that way. And I completely understand why it's worded that way almost never do I think about the work that I'm doing as existing exclusively in a white world or exclusively in conversation with whiteness. Mm -hmm. Because since the 1920s, there have been black artists that have been working in institutions, whether that be as curator, guest curator, or um, as artists, you know, you know, making appeals for their work to be collected. Um, and so for me, it's really like, the work that I do is in service of a community. The work that I do is in service of, um, of being that liaison that helps people better understand and see themselves within these spaces. Right. I'm rarely talking peer to peer. And when I do talk peer to peer, yes, there are definitely challenges that come with um, helping people broaden their understanding of one, either their complicity or their responsibility, which is a journey. Um, but for me in general, I think mm. the work that we all have a responsibility to do is to take care of each other. And I think that that happens institutionally and outside of institutions, but that's where it starts. Like, it's not just about, and that's, you know, the struggle of being an activist in general. Like, I don't always feel comfortable with that label because for me, it's like the work that I do is so much yeah. softer in my own mind. And not that activism has to be hard, but I think that there's this like strange shared public idea there that is 100 percent fighting and like sacrifice and and that activism is only only looks like being out in the streets with a sign and being like you know uh like you can't sit with people who think differently than you that's i i completely relate to you i i would always correct people when they would call me an activist one because i'm a journalist and i was taught like i you can never be both that that's like polar opposites but also that I was like if you want to call me an activist or if you want to say that the work that I do is activism or if you want to call me an activist then then do it through the lens that the way that I do work the way that I tell stories is a form of activism because it is amplifying voices that we need to be learning from and it is giving you perspective that you typically wouldn't have gotten and I think that act, a lot of activism is rooted in getting uncomfortable and being okay with changing the way that you think and knowing that it's okay to change how you think when you learn about other experiences and other people. I know it just pa paused. Did, did you catch any of that? I didn't catch your question. I got a phone call, so my phone started buzzing, but. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. But I was, what I was saying was, so 
I, I've always said that, like, if you're going to call me an activist, then, then do it through the lens that, like, the way that I tell stories or the way that I approach my work is a form of activism because of its truthfulness and because of the approach of being able to amplify voices that we need to be learning from and then being able to, like, sit in discomfort visibly. Like, I will put myself in a position where it's very clear that I'm sitting in, in discomfort, but to learn about somebody's experience that I'm not familiar with. So like, there's a different approach to it, but I don't think that we, I think that when we label, and also the other thing about like being labeled an activist is it almost feels like anytime you're part of a sub community or a minority, you, um, if you're doing any type of work, you're seen as an activist because it's it, it, your identity in and of itself seems to be standing for something else. And like, that's how it's seen. So, and this is a struggle that like I've had, which is being able to just let my work speak for itself, but also people will like, it sometimes have a hard time seeing past like what, I, what I'm wearing or what I am wearing on my head to like actually just pay attention to the work. Yeah. So I struggle with that term and that concept as well. And I think that we need to broaden it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've spoken a lot with friends publicly and privately about what it means to be disruptive. And I think there's many ways that that label or way of being is something that is placed upon us when it's like, that's not it, you know, like, there's so many things that we do that are externally seen as political, but internally are seen as like commitments to our own faith, um, you know, ways that we profess exactly. our own values. Um, and just because your normal is different than my normal doesn't mean that what I'm doing is inherently disruptive, is inherently activist, is inherently political. It's so strange. It's so strange. Oh, yeah, it totally is. But when I, so originally I suggested the topic of finding yourself in art because I think that that's something so many people, like when they think of art and they're not really familiar with it, they find a hard, like they find it hard to like, find an entry point but then you said finding yourself in art and resistance and so I wanted to ask you why those two go hand in hand for you, for you why is it important for um for you to put art and resistance together and then what does finding yourself in resistance look like for you yeah um I think it's interesting you know in relationship to the conversation we were starting before um I think art helps us locate ourselves and I think it is that literacy that we gain through images and through art making practices that help us better understand ourselves and the world, right? So if you're seeing more art that looks like you or looks like others, you're building a comprehension and understanding. And so there's less of that like, oh, this person is you know, different than me. It's more like, oh, this person exists in different contexts than I do. And now we're engaging together and this is what I've garnished from this study of art or from this artwork or from reading this person's poem before meeting them. Um, but I think in general, wow, yeah, break down those barriers, which is a part I think of any resistance action because it's based in empathy, you know? There's so much of Black Lives Matter that is based intrinsically in empathy and understanding that black people literally deserve to live. <laughs> but because of our presumed differences or misunderstandings, our lives are seen as disposable, you know? Um, Mm. Yeah. Well, how do you, how would you define resistance to people who are not familiar? I would say that, oh, it's such a complicated concept, which is why I like pivoted towards empathy um, and feeling and seeing. Well, because, and the reason I'm asking it through your, your touch point of empathy is yeah. because when you think about, when you visualize the word resistance, you don't you think about it through a lens of hard hardness almost and um, like pushing away and empathy is the, is the practice of feeling for others. And it's through like abundance and it's, and it's seeing yourself in others. And I understand like through your lens that those go hand in hand. So I want, I would love to know how you define resistance through the lens of empathy for people to see themselves in this. Absolutely. Um, and I love that framing because it helps me answer my question better. Um, <laughs> um, I would say in general, though, I think resistance, the most powerful tool of resistance that we have is unlearning the ways in which we're socialized, 
you know, in, in systems that are unjust, you know? And I think that resistance, like you're saying, can presumably be seen as hard public actions. Um, but I think some of the most brilliant resistance work that we can do is unlearning hate, you know? Um, unlearning, right. you know, this is how it's always been done. And so this is how we'll do it. Like that in, it, in and of itself is incredibly powerful resistance work. And um, yeah. I think that's one of the most important and simple, not easy, but simple ways of looking at resistance because it's simply taking everything that already exists in your life and everything that you've learned and then just questioning it and then peeling it back a little bit more so that you grow as a person. Like, it's so interesting because the even just the concept of unlearning to be able to find yourself or unlearning to be able to be free is so foreign to many people because we've never questioned the systems that we've benefited from. We've never questioned like what that these systems may have done to other people, how you may have been complicit in something that has oppressed others. And it's because everybody lives their lives and everybody thinks that, you know, like I'm doing my thing. I'm not mean to people or I'm not doing anything personally. And they don't realize that we are, we are all interconnected and that we even even if you are benefiting from a system of oppression you are not entirely free because there are people who are who are not as well and so the act of resistance today is something that doesn't solely exist on the streets or on social media it's like a basic lifestyle practice that we need to be able to implement and so how how would you suggest to people to implement practices of resistance in things that they love whether it be art whether it be education whether it be media um or food whatever it is like how do we how do we keep that mindset while we are engaging in the acts of resistance yeah i think in general it starts really simply with reading things that are inherently activist and are inherently um, invested in practices of resistance. I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, taking time to read powerful political thinkers um, just to get a framework of what changes and shifts people are calling for. Um, I think that's a really good grounding practice. And then beyond that, I think um, it is going outside of your own experience and learning the work and artwork and watching that documentary about Malaysia or wherever else in the world that maybe you haven't seen and so therefore you don't understand. Um, I think taking that stretch just outside of your comfort zone and allowing those impressions to be made upon you um, is inherently a part of resisting a way of thinking that there is extreme difference between all of us. Um, I think in general, the work of white supremacy is divisive. And so how can we learn through a practice of cultural appreciation? Um, that's, that's, I think, a brilliant way, especially that the arts can be applied to resistance work. And that's not all of it. But I think it's a good, yeah, a good foray, especially in this moment of, you know, social distancing. I know everyone hates that term now. Um, but if there's a way to spend your, you know, the time that you can find for yourself, I think education through culture is a, an exceptional way to begin that journey. Well, so you mentioned the term cultural appreciation and on social media, you see the term cultural appropriation drastically more than you see the term cultural appreciation. So can you clarify in like, in your opinion, what cultural appreciation looks like so that people know what the best way to go about doing so is? Yeah, I think about like gastro diplomacy, which is diplomacy through the lens of food. Um, and you think about a country like Thailand and like the expansiveness of Thai food. I love Thai food, you know, like, I love it. 
I frequent Vietnamese restaurants in my neighborhood as well. You know, there's so many cultures that I invest in through practices of being a consumer. Um, I appreciate those things, but I would never in my life publish a cookbook of Vietnamese recipes and call them my own. That's the difference. There's a way to participate and to invest um, that doesn't inherently um, harm or like cause harm or cause, you know, reattribution or an invisible, you know, further invisibility of marginalized people. Um, and I think it's our, our incredible duty to do that, you know, so it's not to say don't watch that documentary or eat that food or wear that thing, but also know very intimately where those things come from, invest in where those things come from. Um, before especially your capitalist impulse come kicks in <laughs> and you think about yeah to, you know um, which is what you know is so difficult in the social media sphere well so i think food is one thing but fashion is completely another how is it possible to appreciate fashion that comes from a culture that isn't your own in an ethical way Absolutely. I think there's ways, I think it's difficult. It's the difference between like what it means to observe and what it means to wear. First of all, like I would never wear a sari, but I love saris, you know, or like, but if you had a friend, you had a friend who asked you to wear one for her wedding, would you wear one? I would go through great straights to make sure that I was buying it from <laughs> the proper shop in the proper neighborhood. Um, and that I was tying it correctly, that, you know, the color, know what the colors meant, um, know exactly where it was produced. Um, I think in those instances, it's really important that you're being really extremely cautious, right? Um, and really, really, really caring in the ways in which you, um, yeah, if you do wear it. But yeah, for sure, I would totally do it, but I would make sure that like every well, friend all the things were on point and like that whomever's parent was like, this is correct, you know, before I let anyone in the world see me. Um, but it is a super complicated one. And uh, I've definitely had many, many conversations with friends about the most thoughtful way to do it. I don't know that anyone's quite figured yeah. it out. That's, that's been my strategy. Well, the reason I'm asking is because like, I know that, um, and I see a couple of the questions and I'll, and I'll get to those shortly, but I when the when the term of cultural appropriation first like came into my orbit many years ago I remember like talking about it with my mom and so our family is from Libya which is in North Africa and I just know that when you go back to like back home or back to the motherland or whatever people get so excited when others from different cultures adopt like wear their clothing or a dress because it's like it's it's culturally it's seen as so respectful and honorable and it's just like thank you for embracing me and thank you for embracing who we are and stuff and so I didn't realize like I felt like cultural appropriation I come which I completely understand but I um I felt like the context of what culture and where you are geographically uh, really plays a role because I think in America it plays a completely different role than like if you were in Libya and you were to wear like the Libyan outfit with the gold and the whatever and all of that and, and a woman like no one would be offended by that so it's like but if you were to do that here it might be taken differently so that's where I'm like how do you go as, as a visitor and as a guest we still have like, for example, whenever I travel, I make sure I buy something from a local artisan. Like, that's a practice I know we yeah. do. And yeah, yeah, yeah. so if I were to go to Libya, like, I would want to find the people who are on the ground there making the thing, invest in the totally. local economy, and then I could wear the thing, and then maybe, you know, engage in these other ways. But I think that there's something that happens, for example, with, like, Dutch kente cloth or with other cultural, like, presumed ephemera, and especially in the case of Kenta cloth, that people don and don't invest or don't participate or don't do the research 
or ask those questions. And that's when cultural appropriation really is like, what the fuck? Or when you see, you know, I forget which runway it was, but like the cornrows on the runway and you don't see black models or black designers being attributed. You don't even see black hairstylists making these wigs. That's a problem. And that is a, that's, a problem. yeah, is existing within a capitalist framework. And so there's a way that you're directly monetarily benefiting off of the culture of someone else. And that's really the rub. Um, because there well, are one of the questions be, you know, employed, like you look at a brand like Lem Lem, where it's like, you're really working with artisans who are truly skilled in craft in their craft. And when people don't do that, you know, that's the problem. Yeah, comb. It was the comb show. So it's, yeah, I, it gets me heated. Sorry, Nora. Totally. No, it's, I completely understand. It. And that's, and to me, like, I feel like that's very just like basic humanity and basic understanding. Like when, when I see, I, and I know what show you're re referencing, that to me is just like common sense. How could you not know better? But then, so one of the questions was, my son wanted cornrows because he's obsessed with Cowhee Leonard. Is this, is this Kawhi? Sorry, I don't know who this is. I was we like, cause. <laughs> I'm Kimberly. Is that an athlete? Yeah. Yes. That's why. Adam was like, don't disrespect an athlete. But is that cultural appropriation for the mom who want, whose son asked her for that? I think. I mean, I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule that anyone can define in terms of what offends anyone and what attributes to cultural appropriation. I think it's a trap whenever any of us are asked to answer this question. Um, but I think in general, it's important for the parent in this scenario to say, yeah, Kali does wear these cornrows. I don't even know if Kali wears cornrows. Like in my mind, my, my image of him doesn't have cornrows, but that's fine. Um, this is where... <laughs> comes from here you know here is the technique here is a natural hair care video on YouTube um, how you know this is where this comes from this is what it looks like here's you know images of this like what kind of style do you want even like let's look at Alan Iverson's braids which I think are like some of the most exquisite examples of cornrows in history um, I don't know that putting them into the hair makes sense because I also don't know what the hair texture is but like have a conversation with your son about hair texture. Like there's so well, much. So that was exactly the, the, the reason I wanted to ask that specific question and not just like, can I do corn, whatever yeah. is because what it, how do you approach this conversation with kids? Because kids are so like pure and they, they're, they're still learning and they're still observing. So what, how are we supposed to teach kids to make sure that they're coming from a place of love, love appreciation and total respect, and that they're also learning what it means to stand in solidarity with the people that they admire through every like that, like, just like cultivating better kids so that they become better humans, you know? Yeah, I think in many ways, in the same way that you might interact with an athlete that you love or a style that you love, kids can just as easily interact with the histories and the context. Like kids aren't dumb and they are porous and so whip smart. And so how can you as a parent or as a caretaker or as a participant in a part participant in a young person's life, continue to embolden their curiosity? You know, like the curiosity isn't the problem. Curiosity across cultures isn't problematic. It's when that curiosity isn't informed with context that you set people up for failure. And, and that's the thing. It's like, mm -hmm. we make sure that we're children and adults alike, making sure that the things that we're do that we are doing are tethered um, because they aren't that, that lack of tethering it is, is a violent white supremacist act that is just so normal, like denormalize the quick version of the story, you know, like, right. That's it. Right. I love that. Okay. So. Your book is called, This is What I Know About Art. So can you give us, since we're talking about kids and young people and all of that, what is one of the things in your, that you mentioned in your book that you want all young people to know that you know about art? Ooh. Um, it's so distracting watching everyone like talk about <laughs> Alan Iverson now in the comments. I also am really <laughs> appreciating the engaging comments because people are actually engaging like with really thought 
like thought provoking intentional things. So thank you to everybody who's engaging in this conversation. We should do more of these things. Some people who I really love in this. Um, But at any rate, um, what I want young people to know most principally about art um, most urgently is kind of the, in the construction of the book, I share almost 40 names of artists um, very intentionally. So it's like, okay, at least now you know 40 names of artists if you read the book. That's great. That's a great launching part for, point for anyone. I think so many people don't participate because they don't know where to start. Here are 40 names, run with them. Um, secondly, I want young people to understand that they don't have to lose any part of themselves to participate as an artist or arts worker, um, which was a really tough lesson that I learned um, especially to answer your, you know, to your first question about what it means to work in an institution where you are a minority in some way. Um, I don't want a culture in which people feel that they have to divorce themselves to, to, you know, divorce parts of themselves to be the most productive version of themselves in these types of environments. One, because we're not our productivity. Um, but two, because our work is better informed when there's more context, which is like kind of the underlying theme of our conversation. I feel like that is one of the best takeaways to have from a conversation like this. And also the idea of content versus context is something that's been on my mind a lot lately, because even if we all get the same content in front of us in a classroom setting, in a museum setting, in a, in a conversation, the context is what every single person is going to derive their experience from and derive their perspective from. And until we start normalizing and making it comfortable to sit and have more of a conversation focused on context and understanding the context and understanding history, we are not living in like the maximum growth potential for learning that we could possibly have. And that's just sad because we all deserve to learn. We all deserve to grow. We all deserve perspective. And so I appreciate that. I appreciate that takeaway so much. And I appreciate the emphasis on context. And I think now more than ever, not only is it important when you're using social media, when you're putting work out, when you're having conversations, but as a consumer, as a, as a viewer, as a listener, I hope that people take away like knowing that whatever you're seeing has deeper context around it. And instead of formulating an opinion or a salt, like what a a judgment or whatever it is, knowing that if you don't have full context or guarantee that you have the context, what your story that you're telling yourself about this situation doesn't hold weight. And like, that's the takeaway that I'm giving to myself because it just takes, it's just, it's such a waste of energy to feel so passionately, to feel like uh, any negative feeling towards something when you don't have the context and to feel like you are in a position where you can make a judgment or form a strong opinion over something that you still don't have context over. So let's live in context. Woohoo! Kimberly, how can we support you in your work? Um... I think in general, we can... Besides calling you Kimberly and never calling you Kim. Never, ever, ever. Um, I think in general, I just love that call for context. Um, I think a lot about icebergs and I'm like, just get in it, get in it. Um, But yeah, I feel like that would make the world easier for all of us. Um, But at any rate, um, I'm at Museum Mammy across social media. Um, I, again, wrote a book for teenagers and everyone really that's about art and activism, please buy it. Audiobook is available. Ebook is available. Um, did you read the audiobook? Did I, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, did yeah. Did you voice my, the audiobook? It's my voice. And I actually, you know, like I've read my book like a few times now and I can firmly say it's very good. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, it also kind of love that. a part of a collective of books that are all really incredible. Um, and yeah, just keep being kind to each other. Keep tuning in for Nora's incredible selection of people. You're curating such a powerful group of people. Um, I love you. I miss you so much. Remember when we used to be on set together? Yes. Together? And next time I'll bring cats since you don't want to make the commitment with me. 
sweat. I can't do You're such a better adult than I am. Like, you have no idea. You're leaving. <laughs> I will let you, you can, you can borrow our cats anytime for comfort. I love you so much. I appreciate you. Um, the person who asked if you can read a passage from your book, because we, this is over time, just order the book or listen to the ebook and hear her read it. Yeah. Cause that would be the great way to support. And thank you so much, Kimberly, for your time and for your insight and for the questions that, um, you know, we're just a little not deeper, but I'm trying to think like the questions that we all want to ask, but don't always get to ask. So thank you for answering those ones. Of course. Thank you for asking them so gently. Love you. Appreciate you. Talk to you soon. Bye, darling. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for listening, for watching. I'm about to go join a Zoom conference for something called Marketing Now, and it's about uh, leadership, leading courageously today. So I retweeted about it. If you're on Twitter, you can go um, get the link. I think you can register and just join. And tomorrow, we're hopefully talking to Demetrius Harmon, who's really amazing. And we're going to be talking about why you matter and uh, keeping that mindset. So... Thank you, everybody, for participating. This is so much fun, and I will talk to you all soon, as usual, at your service.